Hi, everyone, and welcome to our second and final press conference for today, Tuesday, June 11th, here in beautiful St. Louis, Missouri. Over the past couple of days, we've heard a little bit about our closest star, the sun, as well as our ga home galaxy, the Milky Way. So today, in our second press conference, we're going to hear a little bit about both. Um, so, oh, excuse me. To introduce myself, I'm Carrie Hensley, the AAS Media Fellow, and assisting me today is the AAS Press Officer, Rick Feinberg, who's going to be monitoring the webcast. Um, I'd like to take a moment to ask you all to silence your cell phones or anything else that might make noise during the presentations. If you are in the room or watching online and you subscribe to the AAS press listserv, there should be one press release going out from today's briefing. And the, um, for those of you watching at home, the uh, video from this morning's briefing either is on YouTube now or will be shortly. So what's going to happen today, for those of you who haven't been able to sit in on a press conference before, I'm going to give a brief introduction of our four panelists and what they'll be talking about. We'll have each panelist speak, one right after another, with no time for questions in between, and then we'll have a question and answer session after we've heard from all of our panelists. For those of you who are uh, journalists off-site watching via the web chat, if you'd like to queue up your questions for Rick, he will convey those to us afterward. So the topic of today's press conference is more sun and more Milky Way. So we're going to start out close to home with the sun. We're going to hear first from Kevin Reardon from the National Solar Observatory. He's going to be telling us about disentangling chromospheric temperatures and dynamics. Next, we'll go to Lauren Matilski at the University of Colorado. He'll be telling us about exploring the coexistence of two distinct dynamo states in the sun. From there, we'll go a little bit farther afield to the interstellar medium and the Milky Way. We'll hear next from Jacob Bernal from University of Arizona. He'll be talking about formation of interstellar C60 from silicon carbide circumstellar grains. And our final speaker will be Anna Bonazza from the Center for Astrophysics. She will be speaking on dynamical evidence for a dark substructure in the Milky Way halo. All right, so Kevin, you're our first speaker. Yep. So my name is Kevin Reardon. I'm from the National Solar Observatory uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I've been working with a couple of grad students, both at uh, CU Boulder and at the uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology, um, to do some uh, observations and analysis of uh, the solar chromosphere as observed from ALMA. So just to explain a uh, couple terms there for anyone who, who might not be familiar. So ALMA is the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array in the high desert in Chile. Uh, it's 64 antennas, um, and it's a large international project uh, funded in the U.S. by uh, the National Science Foundation and also the European Union, Japan, and several other countries. And it does uh, interferometry in the millimeter wavelengths. Uh, the chromosphere is that region uh, of the sun between the photosphere, where we see the sunspots, and the more extended corona, uh, the hot corona uh, around the sun. And we, we call it the gateway to the corona um, because it's that region where magnetic fields start to dominate on the sun, and we start to see for the first time in the solar atmosphere that structuring of, of magnetic loops or, or fibrils where the magnetic field is confining the plasma. And it's also where the temperature rise uh, first begins. We have the mystery of, of why the corona is so hot, the millions of degrees. The chromosphere is the region where that uh, temperature inversion first starts, uh, and we start to see that initial rise of temperatures as we move outward, that, that open mystery we have on the sun. And so studying the chromosphere is a way to address that, that problem. So why do we want to uh, observe the, the sun with ALMA? Well, it turns out the wavelength range of, of 1 to 10 millimeters uh, on the sun is formed about in the chromosphere itself um, at a variety of heights. But right in the bulk of the chromosphere is all that emission in the millimeter wavelengths from the sun. 
And I'm gonna, today I'll be showing some observations taken at about a three millimeter wavelength, which is formed at about a thousand kilometers up or so in the atmosphere, so right in the chromosphere. We have other diagnostics of the, of the chromosphere, of course, in the optical, in the visible, and the UV uh, that give us a lot of information on uh, magnetic field and velocities and so on. But the ALMA millimeter observations or, or millimeter observations, uh, that continuum that's formed in the chromosphere is a really unique diagnostic and a very straightforward way to get the temperature in the chromosphere, uh, much better than, than any other method we have. So it's uh, very easy to interpret and it's just a linear correlation between the temperature and the, the brightness we see uh, in the millimeter wavelength. So it's very powerful. And so of course, people in the past have, have used this and have observed uh, millimeter wavelengths going back uh, 50 years. The most recent high resolution observations before ALMA were done with uh, an array in California, the, the BIMA array. Um, and you see the example of their observations there uh, on the far left with the, the green square. And you see they, they show some variations in brightness or temperature in the chromosphere. The other two panels show uh, magnetic field or magnetic field proxies in the sun. And there's some correlation there, but it's a, a somewhat blurry picture uh, from those, those older millimeter observations. So we don't have a good feeling on uh, what they're showing us about the chromosphere itself. And so with ALMA, the bigger array, more antennas, uh, larger, uh, a bigger uh, dispersion of those antennas, we can get higher resolution now of the solar chromosphere. And so that blue circle shows the, the kind of fields of view we have with ALMA, so they're smaller than we had. But now uh, that picture on the left is, is an observation we took in 2017 in the three millimeter wavelength, and we start to see a lot more structuring in the, in the solar chromosphere. We start to see below at the extending out from the, the center of the field of view going down, we start to see some of that long uh, um, fibro-like structure, the indications of the magnetic field uh, and how it's confining the plasma. And so this is what we get when we, we go from uh, the 7,500 kilometer resolution we had before now to Alma where we have about 1,400 uh, kilometer resolution. And what was actually the, the most exciting part and unique part about our observations were the fact we had simultaneous observations uh, from the National Solar Observatory's telescope in New Mexico, the Dunn Solar Telescope. Uh, using an instrument called IBIS, um, and we are measuring the H-alpha line, hydrogen alpha, the, the classic red line of the solar chromosphere. Um, and we were able to get simultaneous observations. We had uh, amazing coordination with, between these two telescopes in, in real time, um, trying to make sure we were pointed at the same place at the same time. Um, and, but we had this simultaneous data set, and we start to see in those two images some similarities between some of the structuring in there. But the most powerful thing about IBIS is that it doesn't take just a single wavelength. It's able to scan through a series of wavelengths uh, in a single spectral line and step through and build up these spectral profiles at each point in the field of view. So it's called an imaging spectrograph. And we're able to obtain these, uh, these maps through the whole H-alpha line. And what we do is we measure, uh, one parameter we measure is the line width, how broad that line is at each point in the field of view. That's indicated by that blue line showing the, the sort of width for, for one particular spectral line. But we map that out over the whole field of view. And now when we compare that to the ALMA observations, the similarity was just uh, striking, um, sort of unexpected how closely these, these map together. We suspected there was some uh, similarity between these two, but the, the close coupling between them was uh, quite striking to us. We did some analysis of the, uh, the, the physics of the line formation and how these two different types of radiation are coming out of the sun, and we think we understand uh, why, they're, why they're closely coupled. Um, so we have uh, you know, these observations, and these, we've learned a lot about the chromosphere already with these. We continue to analyze them, of course. But we've learned how the millimeter and the optical wavelengths are, are both interrelated, their, their formation, which is important uh, to the structuring, overall structuring, our understanding of the structuring of the chromosphere. This allows us to better interpret existing observations of, for example, the same H-alpha line profile that's widely observed. We have a, now a key to understand some of the, uh, 
how to interpret that profile that's been hard to do in the past. So this has been, uh, has, I think, has unlocked a, a better understanding of that line profile. And it also shows us how highly structured the chromosphere itself is, both spatially on scales as fine as we can resolve, down to just a few hundred kilometers, and temporally down to temporal times of just a, a few seconds. And so um, there's a lot of dynamics uh, in the going on and the temperature changing very rapidly, which will help inform us of what this heating mechanism is in the chromosphere and then on up into the corona. And what does the future hold? Well, so we saw with BEMA uh, going to ALMA, we had this five times increase in resolution, and now we're suddenly seeing a lot more structures in the ALMA data. We see uh, the, the effect of the magnetic uh, field there, and we start to understand much better what we were seeing in those, those older lower resolution data. So what's a, you know, really exciting for me is that in the, in the next year, we're going to be making a similar jump from our current very high resolution observations we get from the, the Dunn Solar Telescope there uh, uh, in um, New Mexico. We're going to make a five times jump in resolution as we go to DKIST. And so the prospects of, of what we're going to see, uh, you know, with that, uh, with the NSF's DKI Solar Telescope uh, is, is very uh, exciting and um, we're looking forward to that. So thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Lauren Matilski from the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'd like to spend a few minutes today uh, talking to you about the solar dynamo. So dynamo is basically a fancy word that solar physicists use to describe the sun's magnetic field. And the most obvious uh, symptom of the magnetic field are the solar sunspots. And so in the upper right-hand corner, you can see spots covering the surface of the sun. And these are highly magnetic in nature. And the nature of the sunspots really forms um, what we would call the central uh, unsolved problems in solar physics. And number one is, why is there an 11-year period associated with the sunspots? Um, so every 11 years, there's a maximum in the number of sunspots, and the magnetic field is more intense. And we really don't understand at this point why um, the sunspot cycle is 11 years. And unfortunately, I'm not going to answer that in this, uh, in this briefing. And the other thing is, why are some cycles more active than others? Um, sometimes an 11-year cycle is a particularly violent one with a high magnetic field that produces a lot of solar flares. And uh, we had a talk yesterday in the press briefings about solar flares. They can, these can be highly eruptive events that can bombard the Earth's atmosphere with high-energy radiation and really do unkind things to our astronauts in space and our satellites and potentially even our power grid. So it's really important that we understand um, where the magnetism uh, creating these events comes from. And finally, there's really the, the calling card of solar physics, and this is the butterfly diagram. So this is the big plot um, on, in, in the lower uh, portion of the slide, and what it's showing is where the sunspots emerge um, as a solar latitude, so how far they emerge from the equator versus time. And as you march forward in time, uh, you find that the sunspots first appear at 25 degrees north or south of the equator, and then slowly appear at sites closer and closer to the equator. And this makes up the iconic um, butterfly wing. Um, and we really don't understand why this equator work propagation is there. And um, this is something that uh, my group and I have been seeking to answer. So unfortunately, we can't dive into the center of the sun and measure the magnetic field because our instruments and us would get burned up. And so what solar physicists do is run massively par parallel uh, supercomputer simulations to try to figure out where the interior magnetic field is coming from. And what I'm showing here is one such uh, video of a simulation, which I'll be talking about for the rest of the time. And uh, what, so what I've done is these are fully 3D uh, simulations, and there's no good way to cut a sphere. So I've chosen one such way, which is to dive down um, about halfway through the layer and image, take a, a spherical cut of the domain. 
and then map it out onto a flat plane. So this is the full sphere, the equator is this horizontal line, and all the longitudes are surrounding it. And uh, on the uh, left-hand part of the plot, uh, we can see basically tracers of the flow of gas. And it's a pretty uh, turbulent, time-dependent, de time complicated flow structure. But amidst this flow structure is actually a very coherent magnetic field. So on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the magnetic field. Red and blue are just different directions for the magnetic field. But what I really want to point out are these, uh, what we, li we like to call magnetic wreaths. They're structures of magnetic field that form amidst the turbulent gas and wrap all the way around the, uh, the simulated star. Um, and they also first appear at mid-latitudes, just like the sunspots do. Now we're much deeper down, so these are not sunspots. We don't allow them to erupt to the surface to form them, but this is where we think the magnetism producing sunspots um, is formed. And very interestingly, these wreaths of magnetism actually propagate toward the equator. And so if you map them uh, with this time-latitude plot, just like the butterfly diagram, you see that there's clear polarity reversals in the magnetic field. So those red and blue wreaths will uh, flip polarity on a very regular cycle. And one thing that was not shown in the sunspot plot is that each sunspot actually has a particular polarity associated with it, and that polarity changes from one cycle to the next. Um, and so this simulation has very clear equatorward propagation and distinct polarity reversals. And so it's very reminiscent of a butterfly diagram, um, which is interesting in and of itself. But that's not all the simulation does. And actually, if, so if we zoom out and look at the entire simulation as a function of time, at this point we're so far out that the red and blue cycles have all blended together in these uh, purple streaks. And after about 2,000 rotation periods of our simulation, uh, it, there's developing an asymmetric mode. And what happens is, is there's a large amount of magnetic field that appears all of a sudden in the southern hemisphere, and then it wanders in, into the north, and then back into the south. And after another few thousand uh, solar rotations, it disappears and goes back to regular cycling again. And so if we zoom in um, to this region of asymmetry, we can actually see that it's a very strong wreath wandering from hemisphere to hemisphere. And it reverses polarity, and it does so uh, with a few of these regular cycle periods. So it's really superimposed on top of this regular cycling. The, the regular cycling never goes away, and there's this irregular bit that occupies one hemisphere um, that's just wandering from north to south. And I should caution that this, should, this could be um, a fluke of the simulation. You know, we are constantly simulating you know, the interior of the sun, and we're really beholden to what's observed at the surface. But in fact, there is a really long observational history of so-called active hemispheres, where more sunspots will con uh, conglomerate in the north or northern or southern hemisphere, and this is being, has been observed since 1880. And so what I'm showing here is in the red curve, uh, every year is the number of sunspots, um, and that just has peaks every 11 years, and then if you look at the asymmetric component, so you subtract off the number of sunspots in the south from the ones in the north, it kind of wanders around, and sometimes the north dominates, sometimes the south dominates. Now, I'd be very, uh, it would be a stretch to call this an additional cycle. But what um, the observers have done is to decompose this asymmetric cycle into its dominant periods. And one such dominant period of the asymmetry is 35 to 50 years, which is in fact a few sunspot cycles. Um, so the question that I would like to leave you all with today uh, is could there be actually a wandering interior wreath in the sun? And so um, if this were true, it would mean that the solar dynamo has two faces. One is this very regular equatorward propagating butterfly-like thing, and the other is this asymmetric interior magnetic field that's wandering from north to south. And I should caution that these are very preliminary results. We really need to extend our parameter space and make sure the simulations hold up and see if there would be a way to compare this more systematically to observations. Um, but I do think we're getting tantalizing hints that um, the solar dynamo might have a different nature than we have initially thought. So thank you very much. And
Next up, we have Jacob. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm here today to talk about the formation mechanism of interstellar C60, also known as uh, Buckyballs or Buckminster Fullerene. So C60 is a, a mystery cosmically. It's a complex organic molecule in that it's made of 60 carbon atoms and only 60 carbon atoms. It's been discovered in numerous sources and astrophysical conditions, but this is unclear because conditions in space are very hostile. You have high temperatures and radiation, and it's chemically heterogeneous. So there are 10,000 times as many hydrogen atoms as there are carbon atoms. Uh, the radiation in a planetary nebula like IC418 pictured here is so high it should destroy molecules, not just complex molecules. So how can C60 form? Uh, the, despite its ubiquitous presence in space that the uh, formation mechanism is still the subject of a lot of speculation. Uh, it's been previously proposed that you take uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules, such as pictured here, and you have to dehydrogenate them. C60 has five bonds, uh, five-membered rings that are made out of carbon, as well as six-membered rings, but the PAH is only have six-membered rings, so you have to hit it with multiple photons, break carbon bonds, uh, morph the sheet, and also lose carbons if you're uh, starting material has more than 60 carbons. But we here present an alternative synthesis mechanism that is shock heating and ion bombardment of silicon carbide stardust grains. And silicon carbide is a common type of stardust. So most stars, as they evolve, go through something called the asymptotic giant branch. And uh, in its death throes, it has this shock heating. We wanted to replicate the shock heating uh, and so at Argonne National Laboratory, our collaborators, Dr. Tom Zega and Dr. Uh, Jane Howe, heated a silicon carbide sample to about 1,000 degrees Celsius. We then bombarded it with high energy ions to replicate a radiation that's seen in stardust grains. And we wanted to look, see if any carbon nanostructures are made, so we used transmission electron microscopy to, to find nanostructures, and also electron energy loss spectroscopy, or EELS, tells us something about the chemical bonding. Here are our heating results. So heating silicon carbide will leach silicon out from the crystal, and it makes sheets of graphene. Uh, you can see the dark contrast image is silicon carbide, and on the ends we have these sheets. Um, the spacing in between these sheets is 0.34 nanometers, which matches that of graphite. But most importantly, indicated by the red arrows, we've made hemispherical carbon nanostructures on our surface. C60 is very difficult to observe on TM, so the inset in panel B shows a lab experiment. They put C60 on a nanotube and use electron microscope to see it. And our EELS spectra confirms that graphite is made on this surface. So the pi star feature shown in panel A corresponds to carbon-carbon aromatic bonds, which trace graphite only. And the sigma star feature traces carbon-carbon single bonds that are in graphite and silicon carbide. So in positions one and two, we have the pi star feature. Position three, which is in the center, we do not. The uh, false color composite image, the panel C is pi star, panel D is sigma star. In panel E, we have a carbon enrichment on the outer layers. And so our proposed mechanism is verified by stardust grains that are seen from, uh, extracted from a meteorite. Uh, our collaborators, Dr. Pierre Hanakor and Sachiko Amari, took a graphite grain, a stardust grain. They sliced it. They got a, a cross-section of it, looked at it under an electron microscope and uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy to show the elemental distribution, what's inside. This grain you can see in panel A, has concentric layers around the center. Panel B is a zoomed-in image of the central core, and panel C is 
the elemental distribution, which shows it's silicon carbide. This is in contradiction to models which state that uh, graphite should come out and condense into the solid state first. Uh, this is, in fact, a at one point, this is all silicon carbide. It was heated in a circumstellar envelope, and it formed sheet after sheet of carbon. And grains of this type have been observed before. So we can conclude uh, from our laboratory results, uh, the pre-solar grain analysis, and also there's a great deal of material science research that has documented this phenomenon. It's very well known that as a star, it will evolve off the AGB in its death throes. There's a fast wind, and this smacks into the dust envelope that is around it as accumulated around over the years. These grains are heated rapidly, and ions will impact and implant. Now, silicon evaporates from the surface, and the crystal structure is such that when that happens, you form graphene sheets over and over again. Uh, surface imperfections in our grain will bend the sheets, that are made of six-membered rings, and form five-membered rings at the nanobud. This is necessary for C60 formation. The nanobuds are then removed uh, from the surface, and it's thrown out into the ISM in the final shocks. Now, C60 has very high radiation stability. It can survive for over a billion years in the ISM. And what's amazing about this mechanism is in the, the instance where chemical complexity should be destroyed, it's actually created. We are very excited for this mechanism, the dialogue it will hopefully create on chemical complexity, and also its implications for astrobiology. So I'd like to So I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, without whom this work would not be possible, and funding sources, NIH, uh, NASA, the National Science Foundation, and you for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Bonazza. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics, um, and I'm here to report evidence for a dark object orbiting in our own Milky Way halo. So the evidence comes from this movie that I'll now play for you. So thanks to the ESA Gaia data, uh, we observe a stream of stars, so stars that are mainly orbiting on the same orbit that is accompanied by like a small fraction of stars that looks just somewhat offset from this same orbit and is consistent with being stars pulled out from this uh, one stream uh, due to an encounter with a massive object in the Milky Way halo. And we did try to match the orbit of this object with the known uh, objects orbiting, like the luminous globular clusters and dwarf galaxies, and didn't find a match. So we think this is plausibly a clump of dark matter in the Milky Way. The reason why dark matter is uh, a very big, a billion dollar question in astronomy is that there's a lot of it. So uh, a few months ago, there, uh, there's a lot of news about the most precise measurement of the total mass of the Milky Way galaxy, and it turns out to be 1.5 trillion uh, times uh, larger than the mass of the sun. However, when we sum up all of the stars um, and gas and dust in the galaxy, we only get to something like 70 billion solar masses. Uh, which means that almost 90% of our galaxy is invisible. And it's a big question what this dark matter is. Uh, so big, in fact, that uh, there have been four sessions and the whole meeting in a meeting uh, dedicated at this AAS meeting to uh, discussing cosmological probes of dark matter. And the reason why it's... Uh, good to explore astrophysical uh, tests of dark matter is because different models of the different theoretical models of dark matter predict uh, different uh, 
and distribution of dark matter on, gal on galactic scales. So here I'm showing three different models uh, of a dark matter halo uh, of a Milky Way-sized galaxy. And depending on the exact nature of what dark matter is, uh, starting from the most massive, uh, like, proton ma mass particles on the left do something that's a million times uh, lower mass in the middle and something very, very low mass uh, at on the right, we see that the structure of this dark matter halo is, is predicted to be very different. So if the dark matter particle is very massive, we expect that the a galaxy like the Milky Way should be surrounded by thousands of smaller clumps of dark matter that are orbiting all around this galaxy. Uh, however, if the dark matter particle is less massive, we expect uh, either fewer of such clumps or maybe even a completely smooth galaxy. And so uh, our hope and in this field of astronomical tests of dark matter is that uh, the motions of those clumps of uh, dark matter, if they exist, should be evident on some other structures, the luminous stars that we see in the galaxy. Uh, and what we are uh, focusing on in this particular study uh, are the so-called stellar streams. So these are uh, tidally disrupting uh, clusters of stars. And if you look into this uh, bottom left corner, uh, there is like a tiny dot over here. This is a globular cluster called Palomar 5. Uh, and it has uh, two, uh, two tails emanating out of it, which are stars being pulled out of the cluster by the gravity of, the, of our own Milky Way. And so those stars form this uh, thin, uh, thin stream, uh, uh, kind of a one-dimensional string of stars in the sky. And it's been orbiting the galaxy for, for billions of years. And so it, therefore, it provides a very good test of anything else that is also orbiting the galaxy. So the prediction would be, if there are many clumps of dark matter, they would punch holes through the streamer, like kick stars out from this orderly orbit. And so you can see that there's a lot of uh, other uh, such streamy things in this map. And the one uh, in particular that we are um, interested in studying was this, uh, the long one uh, called uh, uh, GD1. Uh, and it's the longer the stream, uh, the more uh, time it has had to interact with anything else. So that's why it provides a better test of uh, dark matter structure on small scales. And so this uh, map has been created using the SDSS data uh, and dates from 2012. And you can see that uh, you are not quite sure if it looks fairly continuous, this map of the stream, but there is also a lot of uh, Milky Way stars still that are not part of the structure that are uh, in this map because we just weren't able to remove, the, remove all of this contamination very well. However, this, this all changed uh, with the uh, second data release from the Gaia mission. And what uh, Gaia brought us, oops, let's see. Okay, so what Gaia brought us uh, are the measurements of the motions of the stars. So if, what we had before was just a map like this when we could uh, kind of isolate stars, stars ba based on their colors. But now with Gaia, we can actually identify groups of stars moving together, like over here, if you uh, see this cluster those stars are moving together. So this provides us a better uh, decontamination of our and um, of this stellar field. And then applied to, the, to this particular object that I was interested in studying, uh, the stellar stream GD1, it uh, produces something like this. So on the top, we have the updated map of the GD1 stellar stream using the uh, data from the ESA Gaia mission, as well as the, the Penster's uh, the, uh, photometry. And now you can see that this stream no longer looks smooth. It clearly has evidence of gap, one over here at minus 20 degrees, and another one at minus 40 degrees. Uh, and even a line like a small spur of stars that is kind of shooting out of this mainstream. And if we take our best model of the Milky Way that has a component of the disk, a bulge, and a dark matter halo, and try to create the say, uh, this a model of the stream, we can uh, get something that is like in the right place in the sky, has the same shape, 
but it doesn't have all of the structure that we see in the data. So we reproduce uh, one, of, one of the gaps by saying that maybe this is where the progenitor used to be. But all of this other structure, uh, the gap and the spur of stars are just missing. So it looks like we clearly have evidence that something happened to this stream. And what we uh, presented in this paper is a, a dynamical model of the GD1 solar stream that has been perturbed by a massive object orbiting the Milky Way halo. So here is our, our fiducial model where uh, this uh, GD1 stream has been, uh, has interacted or has encountered an object of five million solar masses almost half a billion years ago, uh, and it passed almost right through the stream and was moving at a, a typical halo velocity. And so you can see that this, uh, this encounter pulled uh, this loop of stars out of the stream, so it produces this underdensity that is associated with, uh, with a string of stars that is uh, matching this offset that we observe in the data. And um, as I said, this is, uh, doesn't look like it's something that is known, so it's uh, potentially very exciting, uh, especially given the low mass uh, um, of a few million uh, solar masses, it could have, if confirmed to be dark matter, it could have uh, really distinguished different different uh, warm dark matter versus cold dark matter models. And so uh, I would just like to play this movie again so that you now know the context, you can uh, focus on exactly this uh, mechanism of now a dark perturber passing through the stream, you can see that some of the stars already pulled out into this loop of stars that is orbiting around the mainstream, processing around, and then we, when we come to the present day, it kind of collapses almost uh, in projection. It's like looking very close to the stream and uh, looks very much like what we observe. Thank you. All right, it's now time to begin our Q&A portion of the press conference. So for those of you in the room, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone so that the people on the webcast and the people in the room can hear you. Those of you who are watching online, please queue up your questions for Rick. All right, start with questions here in the room if there are any. Hi, Jake Parks uh, with Astronomy Magazine. This question's for Anna. I was curious, um, if you could just kind of talk about some other potential explanations that don't involve dark matter, if, mm -hmm. if there's any that seem to reproduce the same kind of stream that you saw. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So there's a number of objects that are, that are luminous and orbiting uh, the galaxy. In particular, uh, there are um, almost 170 globular clusters. And actually, what we infer about the mass uh, and the size of this object is uh, consistent with something like a globular cluster. However, uh, we have to, uh, m calculated the orbits of the known globular clusters and they don't come very close to the stream, so they uh, are not likely to be a perturber. However, if there is an uh, undiscovered globular cluster that is maybe hiding in the plane of the galaxy, that, that could be an explanation for it. And yeah. Very quiet audience today. More questions in the room? Susanna? Susanna Kohler, AAS Nova. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on that. Did you look at any models with different masses, with different types of dark matter, and how did those fit in comparison? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. Um we looked into uh, what we can uh, say about the mass of the perturber and the, and the radius, uh, given the observation. So we, uh, we try to match the size of the gap and the location of those stars that are pulled out. Um, and we, we got a range of masses between like 10 to the eight and a few times 10 to the five solar masses. Uh, but they are, uh, uh, we do prefer very compact solutions. So this is uh, more compact than, than traditionally predicted in the, uh, in the cold dark matter universe. So if this actually stands up as being a, a, a dark matter uh, object, it would imply uh, something, something unexpected about its nature. 
Cool. Well, I have a question for Kevin. Um, so a lot of us have heard about the Parker Solar Probe, which is orbiting the sun currently. For you as a ground-based solar observer, what do you hope to learn about the chromospheric and coronal heating problem um, that's complementary from the Parker Solar Probe? Right. From, so the Parker Solar Probe will travel you know, close to the sun and be sampling the solar wind um, close to the sun. Uh, we're able to sort of observe the roots of that solar wind, um, which, which are also sort of coming from the chromosphere and the, the corona as well. And so I'm hoping to learn how you know, the acceleration of the solar wind um, is driven by those, the structures lower down um, and which particles are accelerated. Some particles are accelerated. Some types of atoms are accelerated more easily than others, and that must be tied back into the structure of the magnetic field. So we'll be able to observe that, um, especially also with DKIST, but then map that out and see what the effect is several solar radii away. I have a question over here. Martin Ratcliffe, Freelance and Skyscan. Another one for Kevin. <clears throat> uh, kind of an overriding impression I was getting looking at the detailed resolution of your uh, Dunn telescope images was uh, a sense of uh, depth in those images. So we, is that just my head interpreting <laughs> incorrectly, or are you actually getting some idea from your observations of the height of some of those uh, convection subs. Yeah, I mean, that's. I think that impression, when you look at it, it's very much like that. And I think that's how it's been interpreted to some extent uh, in, the, in the past and informed both also by theoretical models. Uh, but I think what our observations are showing is that as you move out away from the, the line center and you're still seeing those structures, they're not really sampling different depths, but what they're showing are higher temperature regions, and you know it's it's sort of a false impression that that you're interpreting you know that there's different depths. It's just different temperatures, and that's why this is being able to understand that now. I think will be uh, be helpful to you know interpreting lots of observations about the chromosphere. Do we have any questions online? We do. We do. First question uh, is coming from Monica Young at Sky and Telescope for Dr. Bonazza. Uh, she asks, would a five million solar mass dark matter clump have enough mass to collect gas and make stars, or is this expected to be a purely dark object? So yeah, that, that's what's interesting about this, uh, that in most theories of galaxy formation, this is below the mass where you would expect uh, stars to form. Yeah, so it, uh, it would be a completely dark uh, clump of dark matter. Okay, and then she has a follow-up. Um, she says, when in astronomers were investigating possible perturbations of Palomar 5, some other possibilities were a giant molecular cloud or that we were just seeing the effects of the Milky Way's bar. Are either of these explanations reasonable for GD1? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we looked into those, and um, it looks like GD1 is a slightly better stream to, uh, to search for uh, influences of dark matter. Uh, I'll address first the, the bar question. So um, GD1 is orbiting in the opposite direction uh, from uh, the direction that the stellar bar, the Milky Way bar, is rotating, which means that its influence is minimized because they have a very little uh, kind of interaction time. Um, and as for the dark matter uh, or from the um, giant molecular clouds, uh, GD1 crosses this uh, Milky Way disk at a distance of 13 kiloparsecs, so there's not much much there uh, in terms of molecular clouds. However, we did test uh, forcing an encounter to have happened while the GD1 was uh, crossing through the disk uh, and put a uh, uh, the perturber on a disk orbit, so like to be in the plane, and then we could never uh, reproduce this exact same morphology of the of the spur being kind of above the stream. You could you can form it, but it's on the opposite side, so it uh, it looks like it's uh, both configurationally kind of ruled out as a as a possible mechanism. Okay, and then we have uh, two questions from uh, freelancer Rick Lovett out in Oregon. Uh, first, also for Dr. Bonazza, he, 
he's, uh, he w wants you to comment a little bit more on, um, on how the one object you've found uh, might tend to favor one dark matter model over another. Yeah, that's a, yeah, samples of one are always hard. So I would say that this is a exciting demonstration, kind of proof of principle, uh, that we now with stellar streams uh, can find uh, signs of perturbation, that, that, that this is kind of a viable method of testing it. So of course, with, with the one object, it's really hard to argue that it's, that it's not just a random black hole that, that passed through. So we, we just cannot rule that out So uh, with the one object. Uh, object. But however, we are uh, looking at other streams as well. And so that will uh, help us constrain the, the whole population of perturbers in the Milky Way, which then I think will be uh, much more, uh, yeah, will provide a much more robust answer to the question of dark, and the nature of dark matter. But even if it is a clump of mm -hmm. dark matter and it is five million solar masses, um, is there any way from this particular example to, uh, to infer whether it's more supporting cold dark matter, more supporting warm dark matter or hot dark matter, you know, the different mass ranges that you show or the energy ranges you show? Yes, this um, the like five million solar masses that could rule out many of the of the warm dark matter uh, models and I can follow up on exactly uh, where where that cutoff is. Okay, it and then um, Rick's other question is um, for Kevin, I think. Uh, he's asking, um, rel with, the, with your study of the chromosphere, uh, what, if anything, does it say uh, or help us do about predicting space weather? Yeah, our observations were of a, 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 a active region, but very small, and you know, so we weren't actually observing any you know, flaring activity or large uh, space weather events. Um, we need more observations to extend this, you know, correlation and relationship to uh, other events. But I think it, it can tell us, uh, you know, observations of H alpha of this line, which are easier, relatively easy to obtain from the ground on a, on a continuous basis. We have instruments that, that already do that. Um, maybe it'll give us a way to interpret that, look for heating events, right, for drive, leading up to a solar flare, you may see heating occurring in the chromospheric material um, leading up to it or following the flare uh, that may be possible to, to get information like that more readily now than, than we could before. So, um, you know, it's a kind of uh, method for interpreting some, some data that I think could be useful, you know, extended at some point once we've, you know, validated it better in those conditions, um, also the space weather. I actually have a couple of questions myself, if I could, before we go back mm -hmm. to Susanna. Um, so my first one was for uh, Jacob Bernal. Um, I was able to follow your step-by-step -step sequence down to the hemispheric um, configuration of the atoms, but I, I never quite got how that went to the soccer ball, the full soccer ball. Yes, the cages I showed in the diagram of PAH synthesis route that really the hard part is getting the 60 carbon atoms together in the first place, that the buds should, by molecular dynamics simulations, close. C60 is uh, the stable product. So the problem is getting, uh, for the PAH route, they say uh, 60 to 66 carbons. And then you have to dehydrogenate, you have to break the bonds, and then fold it into a spherical configuration, and then lose carbon atoms and close the cage. This we start pretty much at the end of that route. It's, it works under hydrogen-rich and hydrogen-poor conditions. Uh, really, the breaking of the, uh, the buds from the surface should be a trivial matter. Okay. Then I had a question for uh, Anna as well. Um, whenever you see um, a perturb or a projectile go through a narrow stream, you wonder, you know, if that's a rare event, or if that's uh, you know just a lucky mit lucky mm -hmm. hit, or if uh, maybe that means there must be a lot of these perturbers out there in order to have a direct hit on the one stream you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can infer anything about the statistics of how many of these kinds of 
clumps might be out there just on the basis of finding mm -hmm. this one. For example, when Oumuamua went through the, uh, the solar system, people mm -hmm. you know, were able to extrapolate, well, just based on that one, there must be gazillions. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's also a very good question. Um, we did not make the uh, do that calculation ourselves. However, uh, previous studies uh, they um, took this object on the on the, like the GD1 orbit and kind of counted how many encounters it, it should have had, um, assuming some cold dark matter population of uh, dark matter subhalos um, in the Milky Way like galaxy, and it ended up being like one to two in the past uh, seven to eight um, billion years. So it's a kind of small number statistic. So we, we f felt like if we saw one, it's not unreasonable. On the other hand, this is, uh, we are inferring somewhat recent events. So maybe that, that there might be a, a, a slight tension over there. Uh, if I may, uh, we are uh, looking into this in more detail to actually uh, find the orbit uh, of the perturbance to see if it would actually be just like some uh, thing on, on its own or maybe associated with with something else that has recently come in. For example, there are other dwarf galaxies that are coming uh, only recently to the Milky Way, like the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, which are also kind of replenishing this well of uh, dark matter subhalo in the, in the inner galaxy. So we are yeah, looking into the, uh, quantifying exactly what the expected rates should be, given all of those complexities. Okay, that's it from the webcast for the moment. Okay. Uh, Susanna Kohler, AAS Nova. Uh, this was a question for Lauren. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about what causes the formation of these magnetic wreaths. And I mean, do you see that occurring in every simulation? Is that a product of specific conditions? Uh, right. So um, it's sort of a very large parameter space. And so the one interesting thing about this simulation is we weren't actually looking for any of this behavior. So sometimes the wreaths form and sometimes they don't. And that's why it's, it's kind of, you know, it's preliminary in the sense that we really need to explore the parameter space more to see how much this holds up. Um, and the other thing is that even if the wreaths form, they don't always flip polarity and they might migrate poleward instead of equatorward. And so at this stage, you know, we don't know why this particular simulation is displaying so many solar-like characteristics, but um, we're excited by it because it means we can kind of pan out the parameter space and hopefully once it's more robust, then it gives us clues to what the real sun is doing. Okay, any last questions here in the room or online? If not, we can end a few minutes early. Let's thank all of our speakers again. So if you're interested in more astronomy news, you can meet us back here in this room tomorrow at 11 a.m. to learn about even more sun and more Milky Way. <laughs>